Doamna doctor, am sesizat că anumite aspecte sunt foarte, foarte, foarte subtile și ascunde ego-ul. Cum putem să privim în oglindă? Deci sunt foarte multe, într-adevăr, lucruri care sunt ascunse ego-ului, pentru că ego-ul nu le vede sau nu le acceptă, da? că de, de fapt de asta facem proiecții afară. Pentru că nu putem să nu avem atât tărie să le acceptăm, să le vedem în noi înșine. Ne invalidăm și atunci le proiectăm pe ceilalți, e ca și când vrem să scăpăm pe de ele. Dar uh, sunt oameni în jurul nostru care ne le pun în față ca să putem evolua. Cu ajutorul conștiinței. Cu ajutorul conștiinței, prin conștientizare. Filmulețele din seara asta fac acest lucru pentru noi și pentru toți telespectatorii noștri și pentru toate persoanele care la ora asta s-ar putea să treacă prin aceste oglinzi, știți? Că eu, eu cunosc persoane care la ora asta trec, se derulează aceste oglinzi și unele sunt foarte dure în viața lor și au nevoie de sprijin și au nevoie de curaj și au nevoie de speranță. Și eu, am făcut acest filmuleț pentru persoane care au în derulare aceste oglinzi. Uh, pentru că eu știu că sunt puternici și eu știu că pot să fac a, a, acest lucru. Um, acum, oglinda devine inutilă dacă conștientizezi. Vreau să spun că în momentul în care ești în derularea unei astfel de oglinzi și tu suferi acolo și o dramă și ego-ul e foarte alarmat de acest lucru, în uh, momentul în care tu conștientizezi de fapt oglinda, uh, rezolvările sunt miraculoase, pur și simplu se întrerupe fenomenul, ne vindecăm relațiile spontan. E foarte interesant. The sixth scene mirror of relationship uh, is a mirror that has a rather ominous name. The ancients call it the dark night of the soul. And, and clearly the mirror does not have to be as ominous as its namesake. Through the dark night of the soul, uh, we are reminded that life has a propensity toward balance. Nature has a propensity toward balance. And that it takes uh, an extremely skillful, masterful being to upset the balance in nature and to upset the balance in our lives. When we find ourselves in the greatest challenges of life, It is in those moments that we may be assured the only way, the only way those challenges are possible is after we have amassed each tool that will allow us to move through that challenge with grace and with ease. That's the only way it can happen. Until those tools are amassed, we will never see ourselves in the situations that ask us to demonstrate these high levels of mastery. So from this perspective, the greatest challenges of life, those of relationship, perhaps our very survival, may be viewed as tremendous opportunities to demonstrate mastery rather than tests that may be passed or failed in life. And it's through this mirror of the dark night of the soul that we see ourselves naked, perhaps for the first time without the emotion and the feeling and the thought of all of the constructs that we've created around us that we believe keep us safe in life. And it is through this dark night of the soul, perhaps for the first time, we have the opportunity to see ourselves in that way and to prove to ourselves, to demonstrate to ourselves that the process of life may be trusted and that we may trust ourselves in life. The dark night of the soul is um, is an opportunity for us to lose everything that we've ever held dear in our lives and to see ourselves in the presence, in the nakedness of that nothing. And as we climb out of the abyss that is left from everything that we've lost and we see ourselves in a new way, that is where we find our highest levels of mastery. The ancients talk about the dark night of the soul very clearly. I had a client that came to me when I was working in the Bay Area. He was a software engineer, a brilliant software engineer, a young gentleman. He was married, had a wife and two children, two daughters. And he loved them all very much. And in his software environment, his skills were in such demand that pretty soon he began traveling tremendously. Uh, first, he was going to technical sites and then began doing trade shows, uh, tech-supported trade shows. He saw less and less of his family, and the few times he did see his family, he felt like he didn't know them. There was little to talk about on the weekends. He didn't know what his kids were doing in school, his wife, and he, uh, their communication was, was 
uh, lacking. Um, into his department, the company moved another engineer. And it was a woman from Los Angeles, same age. They began sending them as a team to these different programs, and it wasn't, you see where this is going, it wasn't long before he believed that he was in love with this woman. And she believed that she was in love with him. Uh, she applied for a transfer back to her home office in Los Angeles. He did the same thing from San Francisco, and he was given a job in L.A. His, uh, his department was very upset with him. His friends thought he was just out of his mind. Uh, his family was devastated. And he said, well, you know, I'm sorry that I've hurt these people, and that's okay. I'm, I'm off to my new life. So he went to, to Los Angeles, and they were down there about three weeks, and the woman came home one day and said, you know, this is the relationship I thought it was going to be. I'd like to end it. He was devastated. What universal fear did, did he just get lit up? He was devastated when she, when she asked him to leave. He began performing poorly at work, and he was put on probation, and he, he didn't, didn't get any better. The company asked him to leave. And he found himself in a, a strange city, no friends, no support system, no income, no job. And he was blacklisted from other, um, other departments in a similar industry. And he had nowhere to return to because all the things he had held most dear, he had given away. His uh, department didn't want him back. His family wasn't there for him, his friends. And he came to me in the Bay Area and said, what in the world has happened in my life? How do I get my family back? And I said to him, in all sincerity, congratulations, because the only way something like this can happen in your life is when you've attained the highest levels of mastery. And in that mastery, when the last piece of the mastery is put in place, that's the opening in creation that says, now this gentleman is ready to demonstrate this level of mastery over whatever it is that he created in his life. E vorba de noaptea neagră a sufletului. Noi avem, știți că eu am preparate în remediile florale ba, care se numesc Star of Bethlehem, care este exact pentru aceste evenimente. Noaptea neagră, chiar așa se numesc. Noaptea neagră, șocurile. Adică lucrurile groasnice care îmi se pot întâmpla. Ca de exemplu, să pierzi pe cineva drag unei mame să-și să piardă copilul mama în accident sau ceva de genul. Sau, de exemplu, să fie o tragedie când moare toată familia și decât supraviețuiește unul. Gândiți-vă cum se simte acea persoană. La asemenea, această oglindă este despre șocuri extreme, despre momente în care tu pur și simplu nu mai știi deci sfuge pământul de sub picioare, ceva de genul. Este o oglindă, de fapt. Este o oglindă. Uh, uh, dar să știți că foarte mulți oameni tre trebuie prin asemenea situații șocante. De cei de la colectiv da? Părinții celor de la colectiv au trecut, acum s-a derulat oglinda numărul, această oglindă numărul 6 pentru ei, trebuie să știți. Prin astfel de șocuri au trecut. Acum, ele ne provoacă, de fapt. Ele um, um, ne, ne, uh, este o frică, de fapt, pentru cei dragi, că, de fapt, este o grijă, este o disperare pe care o avem. De asemenea, poate să fie frică de boală, de exemplu, cu diagnostic de cancer sau frică de moarte pentru noi personal. Sunt situații extreme care ne pun în lumină, adică reflectoarele pe noi, ca noi să apărăm așa cum suntem fără măști. Pentru că noi de obicei apărăm cu măști, noi nu știm cine este pe dinăuntru, nu ne cunoaștem pe cine suntem noi înșine. Și s-ar putea ca în astfel de experiențe, din aceste experiențe, să aflăm că suntem puternici. Sunt foarte, import sunt foarte importante aceste oglinzi pentru evoluția sinelui nostru superior, pentru că sunt situații când oamenii au dezastru în viețile lor. De exemplu, dacă ai o oglindă numărul 6, să zicem aceasta, în care te pune într-o situație extremă și tu trebuie ca să afli că ești puternic, să zicem că ți-a murit cineva, eu am avut astfel de cazuri, ți-a murit cineva din familie, după care îți moare peste un an încă cineva din familie și pe aia îți moare încă cineva. Deci eu am avut cazuri încât au murit toți pe rând la un an interval. Despre ce este vorba? Este vorba de oglinda numărul 6 care se repetă, se repetă, se repetă și nu se va opri decât când tu conștientizezi de fapt ceva. Dacă tu începi să vezi că de fapt se derulează oglindă și că ești pus la nivel de suflet obligat să faci o evoluție foarte rapid, ai putea să oprești sirul acesta de dezastre emoționale din viața ta. Seventh mystery of relationship, the seventh is seen mirror from the perspective of the ancients, was the most subtle and for some the most difficult. This is the mirror that asks us to allow for the possibility that each experience of life, regardless of its outcome, is perfect in its nature. 
regardless of whether or not we achieve the lofty goals that have been set by others. We're asked, we're invited to view our accomplishments in life without comparing them to anything else, without any external reference. The only way that we may view ourselves in failure or success is when we measure our accomplishments to an external yardstick. And the question then arises, what is it that we hold ourselves accountable to? What is it that we use as our yardstick of accomplishment? From the perspective of this mirror, we're asked to allow for the possibility that all aspects of our lives, each aspect of our personal life, whether it's our body shape or our body weight or our academic or business or athletic achievements, are perfect as they stand. And we will see that they are, in fact, that way and can only be judged when they are compared to an external reference. We're invited to allow for ourselves to be that reference. The last mirror the ancients considered the most subtle mirror. And to share with you this mirror, I'm going to share it in a couple different ways, a couple different stories. I just uh, had a friend that was her age that had a, a young daughter. This daughter had uh, graduated from high school just a couple of years earlier. A beautiful young woman was extremely gifted in many areas. Uh, she was very athletic. She excelled at academics. She was a wonderful artist, and she chose to become a model when she graduated from high school, and her parents supported her in that choice. Uh, she had uh, done some modeling, done very well. She had gone to um, uh, is a modeling school in New York City and had just completed a series of jobs, and it appeared that uh, two years out of high school, she was on her way to a pretty successful modeling career. Well, after the first couple of jobs, the modeling agencies began to say, for this kind of work, you're, you'll have to change your appearance a little bit. And they started with some obvious things. And they, uh, even at her young age, they, um, they did some tucks around her, her midline. Um, they enlarged her breasts, relatively common kinds of, of plastic surgery. Her parents supported her in that, and they said, well, that's what this industry takes. It's, that's what it takes. Well, it wasn't long before the modeling agencies began asking for more extreme forms of, of modification. Uh, and for example, she had uh, a really cute little overbite when she'd smile. And they said, well, you can't have an overbite and be a model. So uh, they asked her, and she did, when, uh, underwent a, a procedure where her jaws were broken and reset, wired shut, and the idea was that, that the overbite would be gone. And to be honest, uh, I saw before and after pictures. I, I could see very little difference. I really could see very little difference. And I thought the overbite was kind of nice. Well, while her jaws had been wired, uh, of course, her, uh, she was on limited diet. She lost quite a bit of weight, and, uh, which is generally desirable in, in the modeling industry. And as she lost that weight, uh, some of these ribs, the lower ribs, floating ribs, uh, began to stick out more than they had before. And the modeling people said, well, that's no problem. We can address that surgically. And they did. They went in and took out these two floating ribs on either side. And, and something began to happen with her. And uh, maybe you've seen this before. Uh, body weight kind of goes in, um, in modes. I, I was a competitive runner for almost 20 years. And there were some times I could eat anything, no matter what it was, and, uh, and I, I just couldn't keep weight on my body. And there were other times I could think about eating and not do it, and I would, I would gain weight. And your body kind of goes into a mode. If you can stop eating for a while, and you'll still maintain a constant weight or maybe even gain weight. And, um, uh, and you can begin to lose weight, and then you say, okay, well, that's enough. I'll start eating again, and your body is still in a lose weight mode, and it keeps going. And that's what happened to this woman. She uh, began to lose weight and uh, was in a, a lose weight mode. And the phone call that my friend had that morning was from this, uh, the young girl's mother. Uh, her daughter had just died in the hospital from complications of malnutrition in the hospital because her body could not assimilate that weight. And my question was, why did this happen? Why? What was it all about? A few months ago, Melissa and I were traveling. Uh, we live in where well, we have to fly out of Albuquerque to get to anywhere. And on certain airlines, I won't mention airline names, but certain airlines, you have to go through Dallas before you go anywhere else. 
So when I went to Toronto, I had to go from Albuquerque to Dallas to get to Toronto or to Kansas City to go to Dallas. Well, if you've been to DFW, you know uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. It's a huge airport, and there's a tram system that takes you from um, concourse to concourse, in theory, when, when it's up and working. And when it isn't working, it's a wonderful system. It really works well. Typically what happens is we come in on the end of gate 6, and we go out on gate 44, and there's a good half mile, I know, or, or more between the two. And uh, on this particular day, we were at the bottom uh, of, a, of a large escalator waiting for the, the trains to come by. And, uh, and there was a couple that was standing next to me. There was about a three-minute wait between trains. There was a couple standing next to me, an elderly couple. And apparently, the gentleman was hard of hearing. And this couple had an ongoing dialogue, a constant dialogue, where they were, between themselves, where they were evaluating everyone around them. And uh, apparently... It's something they had just always done. Uh, it seemed very comfortable for them. And, and as people would come in, they'd say, oh, look at uh, who dressed that man this morning, you know, or look at, look at her. Why, you know, why, why does she do that? Oh, look at that earring. Well, I was standing here. They were standing here. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw an extremely large woman coming down the escalator. I, I had a client at one time that weighed about 450, and I know that this woman was real close to 400 pounds. She was coming down the escalator, and she was holding an old-fashioned suitcase, old linoleum with brass fittings on the side, hard, hard shell. It was 115 in Dallas that day. And I knew that for whatever reason she was traveling, she must have had a good reason, because travel could not have been easy for her. Uh, the heat, the accommodations of the seats, uh, her legs were swollen, her ankles, and she was carrying this funny little suitcase. And she came up and stood right next to us, and this couple continued to do what they'd been doing, and because the gentleman was hard of hearing, as he was sharing with his wife, we all heard. As he said to his wife, look at that woman. Isn't that terrible? Why doesn't she do something with herself? She should be ashamed of herself for coming in public like that. Now, this is one of those rare opportunities. I was here, the couple was here, and the heavy woman was here. And I believe, on an unspoken level, she consented to me looking at her eyes because she looked right at me. So I looked into her eyes, and she never said a word. And that's how I know that she heard everything that happened. She never said a word. And while we were waiting for that train, tears welled up in her eyes. And I could see she was really fighting just to hold it back, and her face got very red. She'd been hurt by what she'd heard. We got in the train. The couple sat next to me, and I spoke with them, and they were really a nice couple. They were not malicious. I don't think there was a malicious intent. It was just a very unconscious thing that, that they had done with themselves. And in that moment, what I knew was that the three of us had had a rare opportunity. The woman had had the opportunity to hear herself judged. The couple had had the opportunity to judge someone else, and I had the opportunity to witness. Both of these stories illustrate the seventh scene mystery of relationship. And it's the mystery of allowing for perfection in the imperfections of life. Este vorba de cele șapte oglinzi eseniene. Și de unde vin aceste șapte oglinzi eseniene? Ce e cu esenienii? Este vorba de o credință iudaică a esenienilor, așa se numește. Sunt, au fost un grup evresc de dizidenți, de profeți. Um, au fost niște evrei exilați esenienii, ei aveau așa, erau, aveau o puritate a lor uh, de origine samariteană, um, făceau diferența între bine și rău și de asemenea dualismul principiilor era, era lucru care îi guverna. Uh, practic a vorbit despre esenieni în literatura noastră, savantul Constantin Daniel, trebuie să știți, care este o persoană, o personalitate de calibru, a făcut foarte multe observații la nivel de studii în mitologia orientală și așa a vorbit despre esenieni, cartea se numește Esenienii și manuscrisele de la Marea Moartă. Cine vrea să citească poate să ia această carte. Dar, revenind la oglinda numărul 7, fiindcă suntem pe finalul, pe finalul emisiunii, este cea mai subtilă și cea mai dureroasă în același timp, să zicem, trecere pentru că, și provocatoare, pentru că a ajuns să fii provocat la nivel extrem de supraviețuire. E ca și când ești lăsat în junglă singur. E ca și când ai un sistem de valori și te, Universul te aruncă undeva la nivel de provocare, încât a 
absolut tot ceea ce ai știut tu până acum nu mai este valid și trebuie pur și simplu să te redescoperi, pur și simplu să o iei de la cap, de ca și când te naști din dată, în situații foarte traumatizante. Și aș vrea să închei aducând așa un, un respect din partea mea pentru toate persoanele care vor urmări această emisiune și care se află în derulare cu oglinda 6 și 7, care sunt cele mai provocatoare, cele mai grele de trecut, pentru că aș vrea să știe că deși e dezastru în viața lor, ca așa apare, ego-ul este foarte rău, trebuie să știți că aceste persoane, din punct de vedere spiritual, sunt niște maestri. Sunt niște persoane foarte curajoase care la nivel de sine superior și-au asumat să treacă prin această experiență traumatizantă pentru ego-ul ego lor ca să evolueze. Și mă înclin în fața lor. Doamna doctor, vă mulțumim foarte mult. Personal am învățat foarte multe lucruri. În primul și în primul rând faptul că Dumnezeu oferă fiecăruia dintre noi exact atât cât poate duce și cu cât noi trecem mai mult prin acest proces, cu cât în viața noastră ne sunt puse mai multe oglinzi, cu atât este definită și noi ne descoperim din ce în ce mai mult puterea dinăuntru nostru. De fapt, cu cât oglinda este mai puternică, cu atât noi devenim mai puternici. O lecție foarte frumoasă, o lecție pe care am transmis-o telespectatorilor noștri, o lecție personală și pentru mine foarte constructivă și foarte binevenită. Eu până data viitoare vă doresc toate cele bune să aveți parte de o săptămână frumoasă și numai bine!